So my most recent videos have been diving into pieces that I've created myself, and that's all well and good, and they were great opportunities and great learning experiences. But I don't want to do videos on just things that I have done, because that just seems kind of stupid, right? I mean, you can't just focus solely on what you were doing to improve your craft. You need to study other things that interest you and concepts and other people's works. Otherwise, you're just stuck in your own tiny little head and your own tiny little universe. And believe me, they are tiny, because if you do not explore and expand, they do not grow bigger and that's just life so anyway this video will be sort of the stone that kills two birds in that it will be submitted as an assignment for my art history class and it will be an opportunity for me to try my hand at creating content of things that i'm fascinated with and see a lacking of a presence on an online platform like this i mean let's face it people that are enthralled by reading dense single-spaced scholarly papers and watching art documentaries that may seem a wee tad bit outdated, those people are few and far between. But I think it's some pretty cool sh Monet, and I want to show people some cool sh Monet. So I'm going to try and do so in a demeanor that is slightly entertaining. Is it a bird bath or is it a goblet? If you thought it was a bird bath, I would completely understand why. I myself thought of this and thought it was kind of comical because this painting is titled The Titan's Goblet. The Titan's Goblet was done by Thomas Cole in 1833. One of his high paying patrons, Lumen Reed, rejected it, which I think was a huge mistake. Cause I mean, look at this thing. It's just wonderful. It is so mystifying. We see this beautiful paradise atop the goblet with some Greek columns along its brim. I should add that this type of scenery would have been derived from his travels through Europe, which which we will talk about later. We see the sun reflecting this wonderful light off of the water on the lake, so to speak, of the goblet. And then the golden tips of the mountains too. I mean, everything is just so majestic and fantastical. Something that us art nerds like to refer to as the sublime, which was a theory developed by Edmund Burke in the mid 18th century. He defined sublime as art that refers to a greatness beyond all possibility of calculation. Something that evokes fear, wonder, awe, and makes your body shudder all at the same time. But well, let's get back on track here. The sun setting is a romantic symbol of the passage of time. So this could suggest an end of sorts, maybe. But let's just let's just take a second to look at the Titan's goblet, okay? Yeah, so the goblet, the giant goblet, it dominates the scene. It is so large that it is taller than the mountains. Its shadow eclipses the city at the bottom of the cliffs. Unless there are no mountains behind the viewer's vantage point, I really doubt that the poor city down there gets any sunshine at all. All right, so let's back up for a second. Has anyone ever seen this movie with the blue people? Maybe the Marvel movies with this guy. If not, I'll go out on a limb and ask if anyone has seen this anime. It doesn't really matter if you have or haven't, but all three are popular pictures and have a lot or a little bit of Norse mythology rooted in the narrative's plot structure. I won't get into that, but having seen all of those, I immediately saw the goblet as a visual metaphor for the Norse world tree. Apparently, I'm not the only one, and frankly, I'm not surprised. However, it had already been contested and arguably disproved in an article by Elwood C. Perry III. He writes, Ultimately, the similarity between Cole's gigantic goblet and the Yggdrasil, 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 pointed out long after the artist's death, rests on nothing more substantial than the resemblance of the goblet's stem and stone to the trunk of a huge tree. And essentially, he hit the nail on the head with that one. Because the Norse tree is a lot more complicated anyway, with its roots and branches extending to all manners of realms and the like, we don't really see Jack Rembrandt for a Norse world tree beyond the stem of the uh, goblet. Moving on, the Met claimed that the piece suggests the disassociation of the present embodied in the surrounding landscape from the pinnacle of creation which nourished its culture. And I mean, I can agree with this there definitely does not appear to be a way up or down that massive bird bath or goblet or whatever you want to call it and what's more just check out that architecturally diverse city at the cliff's base we got what looks like to be a classically derived dome and layout of the u.s capitol building and also a tower that looks like it could be found somewhere in the balkans or maybe russia and then there's even something of a large stadium like gathering place being shielded by some sort of dam. All of these are examples of relatively younger architecture compared to what exists in the caramelized paradise atop the goblet. But we're not quite there yet, let's back up again. Remember how Professor Elwood Perry over here took a dump on our little Scandinavian world tree interpretation? Yeah, well in 2011, Professor David, uh, 
I'm sorry, Professor. Michel Jacques published a journal article with some Greek and Roman ties, except it wasn't even centered around mythology at all, though it did play a big role. Professor B told of a Masonic inspiration, specifically a certain Masonic ritual that Thomas Cole himself would have witnessed. No, I don't mean a super duper secret cult type of thing. This ritual was called the Wedding of the Waters, and it was quite public. But again, we must back up and dive into the mythological strings that tie together this interpretation. We must start with the Titan sun god Helios, who rode his chariot through the sky every day because that's just what sun titans do. At the end of his daily trek, he would cross an oceanic goblet so as to reach the dawn's beginning and ride across the sky once again. What a riveting routine. This brings us to the mighty Hercules, specifically a bit of his 11th labor. Some jack and Suzanne thus had tasked him with retrieving some golden apples, and his search for said apples led him westward across Helios's goblet to the rock of Prometheus on Mount Caucasus. So already we can see how this makes sense. First of all, Thomas Cole is a Freemason, so I don't really find it hard to believe that there's some Masonic inspiration there. Second, we must face west when looking at the painting because the sun is setting, and Hercules had to trek west to reach Prometheus's rock. Americans at the time, and for sure most Freemasons, paired Hercules' westward journey with Columbus's westward discovery of the Americas, because I suppose Native Americans who got there first and the Vikings didn't count because they didn't kill, enslave, and impose religions with the proper drip. Anyway, Prometheus, chained to his rock, had a big old eagle chowing down on his liver. This was his punishment because he was dumb enough to trust our species with fire. Naturally, Hercules killed the eagle and saved Prometheus, and in return, Prometheus told Hercules how to get the golden apples. Going back to real life, the Wedding of the Waters ritual was conducted in celebration of the newly completed Erie Canal. People at the time saw this as a Herculean feat, symbolically opening the doors to greater salvation and discovery for the Prometheus that is mankind. The Freemasons especially had a very high regard for the classical hero. Standard Masonic representations of Solomon's Temple had the columns named Kachin and Bose, columns frequently associated with the pillars of Hercules. Okay, the Freemasons have done a lot for this country, but Jesus, this just gets nuttier and nuttier from here on out, so here we go. There was this English antiquarian physician and Anglican clergyman named William Stuckley, who claimed that Hercules transmitted Hebrew and Egyptian religion and architecture to ancient Bretons, triggering the construction of various Neolithic structures. Oh yeah, and this dude was a Freemason, allegedly. Okay, so back to the Wedding of the Waters. This ritual began with a 10-day procession of boats through the Erie Canal. Each boat had various high-level ambassadors, all the way from New York City to Sandy Hook. At the end of this procession, a barrel of water from Lake Erie was emptied into the Atlantic, followed by smaller containers of water from the oceans around the world. Professor B makes the claim that the imagery in this painting is derived from this ceremony. This is where it gets real wacky. Hold on tight. He made the claim that the gala is actually moving, stating that it suggests cosmic motion and earthly transport. In his interpretation, the goblet had broken through the mountain range, leaving a plateau in its wake, further supporting the argument by attributing the curve of the waterfalls to the goblet's movement. Making another Hercules connection, Professor B sees that the land and the goblet rests on having a resemblance to the rock of Gibraltar, famously paired with the pillars of Hercules. Personally, I do not see this resemblance that he does, but I should note that Thomas Cole would have encountered this rock of Gibraltar on his journey home from Europe. Regardless, Professor B finishes his connection with the wedding of the waters by poetically stating that the streams from the goblet's basin commingle with the Earth's hydraulics. Quite fascinating. Okay, so now we come back to Professor Perry. Although he claimed that there was no emblematic meaning, he did not think it was without iconographic significance, stating, it involves several pictorial themes, both public and private. Now we come to the point where we must finally back up one last time, all the way to the beginning of Thomas Cole's tour through Europe, a journey that he embarked on in 1829 for advisement of another well-known painter named Washington Alston. He intended to study the English school and works by J.M.W. Turner. Cole was especially fascinated by Turner's de-writing of Polyphemus, which famously shows Odysseus and his crew leaving the dreaded Cyclops' island. If you look closely, you can almost make out the Cyclops hurling a huge rock at the departing crew. While he admired Turner's work greatly, Cole was put off by the misty intangibility of his imagery. He thought it made the scene less realistic. And I mean, Thomas Cole, I know you're a legendary painter and all that, but how dare you question the actions of J.M.W. Turner, you scallywag. Anyway, Professor Perry did his homework and made the argument that the Titan's goblet might have ties to Dinocrates' proposal for Mount Athos. Dinocrates was an architect working under Alexander the Great, and he proposed that the mountain be carved into a statue of a man holding a spacious city in his left hand, and in his right a huge cup, into which shall be collected all the streams of the mountain, which shall thence be poured into the sea. I mean, this makes sense, because Cole would have had access to the various illustrations of this truly legendary project. Both images we see here have an upper-level city and a lower-level city, with water pouring down to the sea, where there are other sailing ships and cities. These images, they share a quality with the Titan's goblet, in that the structures are inhabited on several levels simultaneously and in the present. Though I would question this because of the paradisal quality of the city along the goblet's brim, in comparison with the more or less modern city below. I mean, that still, to me, represents this separation of time, in a sense. Regardless,
this, this suggests the possibility that the goblet was carved by man himself, which could feed into Professor B's spiel. Professor Perry claimed that the goblet existed as part fountain, part volcanic lake, part vase, and part vegetation. I know whack. Except not really if you think about it. So Perry said par fountain because Cole had several sketches of fountains from his time in Italy and it wasn't uncommon for artists to like Italian fountains in the early 19th century. One sketch in particular seems sublime and fantastical enough to guess a connection. Part volcanic lake because Cole made a visit to Lake Nemi and Lake Albano in Italy. These lakes share a number of characteristics with the goblet in Cole's painting as well. For one thing, they all are circular in form and they share an absence of natural outlets for the body of water to flow from. And they each have steep banks covered in vegetation. Cole may also have gotten some influence from Berenice's renderings of Lake Albano. This rendering has a curved basin and artificial outlets for the water to flow from, carved by the Romans, since they were on display in New York around the time of his return home. Berenice's rendition also shares the same vantage point as the Titan's goblet, creating a landscape within a landscape. Part vase, because one could technically look at the goblet as a giant garden ornament, which essentially was the purpose of most garden fountains anyway. What's more, there is a fair bit of resemblance between the goblet and Cole's moss imitation vase sketch. You can see that both vessels have moss along each of the brims, and moss seems to be growing downward almost with the trickle of water from occasional overflows from rainfall. And then I don't think I need to describe how the goblet is part vegetation because fully was included in most of the comparisons we just covered anyway. Plus, I mean, look at it. Vegetation. 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 And that is what we have, ladies and gentlemen. Now we must ask ourselves this question. What does the artwork itself reveal about the values and beliefs of the era in which it was produced? Well, there are some pretty long reaches made by some highly educated individuals, so I say that long reaches are fairly acceptable among us uneducated individuals, right? I think I can say with 100% certainty that the Freemasons were a lot more prominent back then, and they certainly have roots in history that we don't usually look at very closely, which can lead to some wacky conspiracy but also can lead to us finding surprisingly insightful details and imagery such as what we just discussed. I think I can also definitely say that Greek and Roman achievements certainly stood up to scratch back then, and I mean, still do today. Hell, I love sketching out Greek and classical forms that really know how to get the value down. I think it's also relevant to say that though Thomas Cole and company changed the world of art, conventions back then were still fairly stringent. This is apparent to me because even one of Cole's highest paying patrons rejected the painting that I believe to be probably one of his most fascinating works, though I am just one Jack Matisse. That's what the hell do I know? But perhaps what I think is most important, for those of you who are dumb enough to have watched this video in full length, with the exception of my professor for this class, she has the magical ability to quit watching at the first use of an expletive and give your boy a zero. What do you guys think? Scale of 1 to 10, what were your thoughts on the Titan's Goblet? Did it confuse the hell out of you and make you want to go on a Tiger King binge to fry your brain? Would anyone be willing to join me in a heist to procure it? Most importantly, should I continue to make videos like this of pieces that I enjoy. <laughs> Psych, I'm gonna do this whether you fools want me to or not. Anyway, regardless of what I think or what you think, I hope you all are safe and healthy and I will see you around. Mm -hmm.